Hi guys and welcome to the fourth Intermediate Double Bass tutorial with me, Stuart, here at the Virtual Benedetti Sessions. Uh, I can't believe it, we're at the halfway mark already of these virtual sessions and the time has flown past. There's been so much going on, so many amazing videos from all of the incredible tutors and I really hope you're enjoying everything. Um, as usual, I'm just going to remind you, if you're jumping in cold, no one likes jumping into cold water, uh, go and find the warm-up videos uh, that I have done. We've got some lovely stretches, some good movements, um, some really good things for getting our muscles and our bodies ready for playing the double bass. And also just a reminder that tutorials one to three are also available um, and you can go back. If there's still some things you're not getting, don't worry. It takes time to learn all these new and these new PCs and these new skills. So those videos are still available. You can go back find an exercise or find the part that, um, that you're still working on and use them to help you. In tutorial number three, we talked a lot about Paganini and quite a few spots in that. We are going to look at another couple of the variations in the Paganini in today's video, but we are going to start by looking at our Vaughan Williams. The first thing we're going to look at in the Vaughan Williams is a particularly nasty note that comes quite a few times, and that is our A flat, which we can play with four fingers on the E string in first position, the same as G sharp, A flat and G sharp. Now, on its own, it's not a particularly difficult note, but in the Vaughan Williams, we often have to shift from a B flat in half position to this A flat, and that can be a little bit tricky to find. So let's go through a little exercise that can help with that. This tricky A flat, as I was saying, quite easy to find initially, as we know it lives in first position with four fingers on our E string. But it can get quite difficult when we combine it with this B flat, which is a first finger on the E string in half position. Now, we're going to be talking about bar 1516, which is the first time um, that we see the B flat to the A flat. So I'll just play from bar 15 once. You have a look at your music. So it goes one and two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. A great little exercise to practice for this shift sounds like this. Now it uses all three of those notes, but we play the G twice, but with a different finger. And that can help us judge the distance that we're moving when we're shifting. Now, one of these weird topsy-turvy music rules is that often it's the little small shifts that we have to make that are harder than the big jumps in our instrument. And this exercise, if we start it slowly, is a great way to get used to that left hand shift. So we start the exercise with four fingers on the E string in half position, which gives us a G under our four fingers. We then play a B flat on the A string with our first finger. We then move into first position and play the A flat with a fourth finger and then play the G again, but this time with a second finger. Now we loop this round and round, and this is the key bit. Once we've uh, finished the first loop of G, B flat, A, G, we move back into half position and put our fourth finger where our second finger was. And that way, we're really reinforcing to our brain and to our left hand that shift and the distance between those positions. And you can even do it without your bow. Um, just kind of getting our left hand really used to it. So let's try that once through a couple of times slowly. Here we go. So we start on the G, then the B flat, then the A flat, and then the G again, and we'll loop it twice. Here we go. Ready. Good. That's a really, really good exercise for getting used to that tricky little shift that comes again quite a few times in the piece. So watch out for it again coming at bar 20. It also uh, appears again just after C, happens a few times after C. So we've really, really got to keep an eye out and use that exercise to familiarise ourselves with that shift. Okay, we're now going to look at letter C in the Vaughan Williams. And if you take a look at your music, you can see there is a lot going on. It's also worth noticing that from letter C right to the end, we have no more wrists, no more time to sit back and think, oh, what's coming next? So we need to be really switched on and be really sure of what is coming up in the music. The first thing we're going to look at is the rhythm. Now, this rhythm is complicated. There's syncopation, there's kind of ties in there. And also, if we think back to tutorial number two, 
when I talked about simple versus compound time, we also have to think about that because at letter D, we switch out of simple time in three, four, and we go into six, eight for a bar and then switch back to three, four into simple time. And then two bars before E, the same thing happens. We switch into compound time and then the last two bars, uh, we are in simple time. So we're gonna do a rhythm exercise for C. And for this exercise, we don't need our double basses. And I just wanna remind you, I've said this a few times, it's really important that we do some work away from our instruments. Obviously it's great to spend time with your instrument and, yeah, and practicing your skills, but you can do such important and vital work away from your instrument, whether it's working on rhythm or thinking about the character of you maybe just listening. So make sure to spend some time away from your double bass as well, no matter how much you love it. Mine gets sulky about it, but you just gotta deal with it. And it's quite a long chunk, you know, all three lines from letter C to the end. And we've got to watch out because there are a couple of um, rhythmic things to trip us up, like syncopation or ties. And we also switch from uh, simple to compound, as I was saying. So and we're gonna put the beat in our feet and I'm gonna count out loud and I would encourage you to do that as well but you can just use my counting on the video if you want to. Um, and then we're gonna clap the rhythm. Now this is a big smooth appassionato section, but for the purposes of this exercise, we're gonna do short, sharp clapping to get the rhythm really internalized in our bodies. Here we go, one, two, three, one, two, and. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, 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 four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Great guys, well done. So by clapping that rhythm, we're really helping our bodies and our brains to learn it. And once our body understands this, and I've said this a few times about um, rhythm in tutorials, it's really important that our bodies understand the rhythm because if our bodies know it well and our brain knows it well, then when we come to put it on our instruments, it's much easier for our brains and our bodies to tell our hands and our arms and our fingers what to do. Now we're gonna stay with letter C in the Vaughan Williams, but we're gonna talk about some of the bowing and we're gonna talk about some of the notes as well. So go and grab your double basses and your bows and we'll get right to it. Okay, this first exercise at C, we're going to use just our bows. Um, and we've already dealt with the rhythm in the previous exercise. So um, the bowing is quite complicated here, as I said. And there's a little exercise and a little way of thinking about it that can really help us. So uh, one of my favorite cello teachers in the world is this lady called Ruth Beesham. And she lives in Edinburgh and she teaches at St Mary's and she's just incredible. And I've learned so much from her teaching. Um, and I'm gonna share a little something that she told me because it's amazing. So it's all to do with the speed of our bow and the kind of weight and our point of contact. And what I want to imagine, if you hold your bow in your left hand and take your bowing hand, your uh, right hand, and I want you just to move it back and forward in there. Now that's quite easy, there's no nothing kind of resisting against you, nothing to push against. But if you imagine you're in the swimming pool or in the sea or something and you put your hand in water and you're moving your hand back and forward. Now it, it's still easy to move your hand but there's a little bit more to push against, a little bit more resistance and that means you're moving your hand a bit slower. And then if you imagine you've got a huge like pot of treacle or if your bass player's love to think about a sticky bass rosin all melted down and you've got your hand in that, and then you're moving your hand through that. That is our slow bow. That kind of thinking about that really tough to resist and move our hand, push our hand through that big sticky mess. Great, now I can hear you going, right, okay, this is, uh, this is all interesting, Stuart, but what does that have to do with playing letter C in the Vaughan Williams? Well, what it has to do with letter C is that we can use these three different ways to think about our speed of our bow. And if we take letter C, and I'm going to air bow for you now, I'm going to say the rhythm. Uh, sorry, I'm going to bow the rhythm. Excuse me, I made a mistake, but mistakes are fine. Make lots of them, learn. Uh, I'm going to bow the rhythm, I'm going to count. Um, and when we reach my first treacle bow, I'm going to shout treacle bow at the camera. 
and, uh, and just to give you an idea of where the first one comes from. If you look at your music, you can probably guess where the first one's going to come. So this is from letter C. Here we go. One, two, three. One, two, and three. One, two, three, one. Two and three, three, calbo. I'm sure lots of you knew it was going to come on that three beat note in the fourth bar of C. And you'll also have seen in the bar before that, I got through almost all my bows. So if I go from, this is the third bar of C, bar 33, and I went down, up, down, got right to the tip, and then that meant I had my whole bow to go three, calbo. Okay, so that three beat note needs a really slow bow. We need to be really thinking about pushing through the melted rosin or the melted treacle there. And the same thing happens in bar 38 at the end of the line. So let's try air bowing uh, from letter C um, all the way to the end of that line together. Here we go. So get your bow, it doesn't matter, French or German, it's all the same with this. We're just thinking about the speed and thinking about getting through our bow. Getting So for both of those three beat notes, making sure we're getting right to the tip so we've got a whole bow to use for them. Here we go, from letter C, one, two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, three, one, two, and three, three, call, bow. One, two, and three, one, two, three, one, two, and three, three, call, bow. And I really hope you said a treacle bow because I can just see your neighbours kind of going, treacle bow, did we hear that? Usually you can just hear a double bass playing away, but they just shouted treacle bow, didn't they? And that's hilarious because, I mean, I don't, goodness knows what my neighbours think of me with the things I'm shouting and playing my instrument all the time. But that's okay because it's cool. So we're double bass players and everything we do is cool. Another thing to think about with the bow at letter C in the Vaughan Williams involves slurs and string crossing and the combination of those two things. Now, in previous tutorials, I've talked about that challenge, um, about achieving a smooth, connected sound when we have to cross strings in a slur. And it is difficult as bass players, but it's also quite a simple thing for us to practice. And where this can uh, be seen in the Vaughan Williams, if we look at letter C and we go to the fifth bar, uh, at the end of that bar, um, we have a slurred G to C. So we'll be crossing from our E string to our A string and a really, really simple um, and effective way to practice that is to take our bow and I'll just say all this advice applies to both uh, German and French bow equally. Um, the principles are all the same. So we start in our E string and we're just going to, in one long bow, move back and forward between our E and our A. Keep the bow moving, that's the top tip, keep the bow travelling and keep it moving even as we change string to try and get that nice smooth connected sound. simple exercise like that is something that we could build into our warm-up or add it in as a little exercise into our practice plan when we're looking and focusing on a certain area. This is also uh, really relevant at places like at letter D, depending on what you're doing with your left hand, you might actually be crossing two or even three strings there. And again, the same exercise can work across three strings. You know, um, if we take letter D as an example, um, starting on our G, and we're just going from G to D to A and back up again. And really keep the bow traveling, um, traveling and moving at all times. And if we do that, as we move our arm, we'll get that nice smooth connection um, with the next string as we cross. Last thing I want to say about letter C in the talus involves the notes. Um, if you're familiar with second position, then that can be quite useful here and help you. Um, if you're not familiar with second position, please don't panic, please don't worry, because uh, it's a tricky position to get. It's um, one of the harder positions on the double bass, and this passage works just as well using half position. But just a little um, something to try, um, if you're feeling confident or if you know second position well, um, we have a lot of low G to D. Uh, in this passage from letter C. And if we know second position, we can get our first finger on our low G and check that with our open G. Check the tuning. If our first finger is on the low G um, on the E string, our pinky on the A string is now actually on that D. And we can check that with our open D. And that means um, we can stay in second position for that whole first, uh, what, one and a half bars. Uh, so from letter C like this, I'll go kind of slow motion, so. Shift 
it back into half. And then we have that little tricky shift to the A flat that we practiced earlier. Back into second position. Half. Two. Three. And that can be just a little um, a little uh, trick to try and keep the, the bowing a bit more manageable between the E and the A string um, and makes it a little bit easier but it only really works if you are familiar with second position. If you're not familiar with second position, as I said, it works just as well using half position and links in nicely to the exercise we were doing earlier. So from letter C, um, what all we've got to think about is making sure that we're getting the right angle of our arm once we've played the first G and then travelling from the open D back down to the E, getting that the right angle of our arm for both French and German. So from letter C again, using half position, travel over onto the D and back up again. And there's that little shift. Half position. So you can see that using both second position and half position work really well there. They just have their own difficulties. And so you can try both out. And um, if you're super comfortable with second position, you know, give it a go. Even if you've not seen second position before, give it a wee try as well. See if you can um, make it work. But please do not worry about using the half position version because it sounds just as good as well. Now we're going to have a look at the Paganini and we're going to zone in on variation number two. At variation two, the basses have this sort of repetitive rhythm. Now, there's a lot of information on the page here with the articulation and so on. But the rhythm basically goes like this. One, two, and one, two, and one, two, and one. Now, hopefully you could hear and see that I was putting an accent on that uh, last quaver or eighth note that comes in the bar as it's marked in the music. And this can be quite tricky. So let's have a little talk about how we achieve that with our bows. I'll play the first four bars, have a lesson, and then we'll talk about how we make this work for us on our basses. So you can hear that it's the shorter note, the quaver or the eighth note, that is accented, that is short. And then we have to take away all that, and it has quite a powerful explosive start, but then we have to take that away when we play the next note. So ba dum ba dum ba dum And again with our accents, just like we've talked about in previous tutorials, getting a good grip of the string, making sure we've got a good grip so that we can then explode. And then with a fast bow, with quite a bit of weight in it as well, but then making sure that we're taking away that speed, that weight um, for the next note. And that will allow us to kind of get that desired effect. You might want to practice this just using one note, um, maybe even on the open string, so. And that again for French bow, that's coming uh, from um, the weight and from our, um, our index finger, that first finger, really um, allowing us to get a good grip and a good start with the German bow. Again, kind of similar, oops, uh, kind of similar thing, so. Using the fingers, the hand, and that weight of the arm again to go from that explosive accent to a kind of uh, gentler, smoother note um, connected to it. We're now just gonna go straight through onto variation three, which is a very short variation but it has some tricky shifts for us and some tricky notes for us to find. So let's have a little talk about how we play that on our instruments. So this running pizzicato figure at Variation 3 is a little bit awkward for the basses. It sits a bit um, uncomfortably under the fingers, but we are super cool cats. We are super adaptable. We can do anything. So um, we're going to go through it slowly and talk about some of the shifts and some of the options we have for left hand fingering. I'll just play it once and then we'll talk through it slowly. So from bar five of Variation 3, it is... Okay, so there's a lot in there and a lot of left hand movement. So I'm going to go through it super slowly. So we start in first position with the first finger on the A. We then shift so we can get a fourth finger on the C natural and then a two on the B. Now we're going to shift up into half position for a two one on the A to G sharp. And then we can get a, two a second finger just over on the D string for the E. Up into first position for a quick visit for F sharp with four. Back over onto the G in half position, one, two, 
for our G sharp A. And then we're going to move back up and get a fourth finger on the C natural, two on the B, back into half position for the A G sharp, into first position for our F sharp and E. And then um, for our arco bar, we're going to do a one on the A, then move to a one on the B, so that the C sharp's under our fourth finger, and we can get back to first position for the um, the A like this. So that was a lot of information in there. So please feel free to go through that bit of the video really slowly. Ask your teacher for help because this bit is really tricky, and um, I'm sure your teacher will be able to give you a little um, a little bit of support and help you find some of these notes. Another option. Um, for our fingering here, it's a little bit more complicated. But um, if we uh, start as we did the first time, so A, C, B, and instead of going back in half position, we travel up the D string and play the G sharp with a two. And then uh, we can play four on the A, one on the C natural. And that is another option and there's a couple of other little options. I don't want to give you too many, but certainly play around with the two that I've given you. If you have a better one, you know, you find the option that suits you best and use that option. Last thing I want to talk about is just the very end of variation three, um, the two bars before variation four, in fact. Um, and we, uh, we're up in fourth position if possible. So if you can find your high D with the first finger, and then you know you're in the right place and under your fourth finger will be that E natural that we need. And then for these bows, we want to be quite dramatic, um, I feel, with big flourishes and down bows. So we have three down bows in a row and then a, a really, really aggressive pizzicato. So we have... And that pizzicato, I really want you to get down near the end of the fingerboard and give it a really, really big boom. We want it to be one of those ones that kind of um, gives everyone all the cellos in front of us in this section. Go, oh, what was that? And then get a bit of a fright. So that whole phrase, let's try that together. Find the high D. Then four fingers will be your E. And we go, ready. Like that. And really, really, it can be really aggressive using two fingers, even if you want right down to the end of the fingerboard so we get a really direct, punchy sound for that sports handle. Okay guys, that's us at the end of this fourth tutorial. Um, just a quick recap of what we've been looking at. So we looked at the Vaughan Williams and in particular letter C to the end, talking about the rhythm and the bowing, a little bit about the notes as well. We also talked about our Paganini and variation two, um, where we talked about that uh, short accented bow stroke and then variation three, where we spent some time just finding some of those tricky notes and talking about some of the shifts and fingering options there. Uh, we have our second Zoom sectional on Friday in just a couple of days time. I'm so, so excited about that. Um, and like, it would be great if you have any questions or anything, if you're thinking if there's anything that's kind of not making sense or if there's something you really want to ask me about the double bass, then please, you know, um, Friday is your is your chance to do that. You have a live audience with me and uh, I will do my best to answer your questions where I can. As always, if you're finding something a little bit tricky, a little bit challenging, make sure you ask your instrumental teacher and that you're keeping working with them throughout this process as they will have tons of knowledge and tons of guidance they can give to you right now. We've also had uh, a couple of social media posts then of people uh, playing their bass, which is amazing. I'd love to see some more. So whether it's, you know, it's, it's Instagram or Twitter, you can use the hashtag Benedetti sessions, and then you can create your own hashtag. So if you're watching um, one of my tutorials, you can put hashtag Benedetti sessions, then hashtag practicing with Stuart or something like that, or hashtag team bass. And we'd love to see some of them coming in as well. So I'll be seeing you on Friday uh, for our next Zoom section, as I said, but until then, um, just something to think about and just a little reminder to always be thinking about the story behind the music and the character and the imagination that we're using to create those pictures. Everyone has a unique take on this so there are no wrong answers. I love saying that there are no wrong answers to this. You know, I'll hear a piece of music and I will picture something in my head. You'll hear a piece of music and you'll picture something completely different and that is exactly what music is all about. That kind of the feeling it can create and the power it has to make us see things with our imaginations. So when we're doing our technical work, which is really important because we have to teach our hands and our fingers where to go and what to play, but it can be really easy if we're working on something technically and getting frustrated to kind of lose sight of that overall picture of the music. So always just a gentle reminder to yourself to be kind to yourself and to just take a step back, 
be calm, be focused, and then you can start working again at that music. Because it can be frustrating practicing, I know, everyone knows that practice can be really frustrating. So making sure that we're being kind to ourselves, taking a step back and then refocusing with that bigger picture in mind. So uh, I will say goodbye for now and I cannot wait to see you on Friday. Until then, happy practicing. Bye bye.